Um, yeah, the last time that we talked, we uh, there was a request for talking about overwintering your garden and how to uh, how to do that. And so I figured as the garden season is uh, slowing down, and at least we have already gotten snow here in Colorado, that <laughs> is that you know our gardens are are definitely to bed for the winter. Um, but I figured that we should share some uh, tips and and thoughts on how to do that, and we can have some conversations about those things, but I wanted to start by, um, there's three gardens that are going to share this week um, updates about their garden. So I don't have Maria on here, but I have Sarah States from Phipps Conservancy and um, Botanical Gardens, Brianna Finley from Spelman College, and then Maria will um, present, and she's in UK at Sheffield University. Um, so sorry for the, we translated this into Google Slides, so sorry if the formatting is a little off, but um, Sarah, go ahead and we can, I'll let you talk. All right. Thanks, Donica. Um, so I just wanted to say hello again. Um, so I'm based in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we have a um, botanical garden, Phipps Conservatory. Um, and we have, uh, this was our first year um, doing an ozone garden and we were a little slow to get started. Um, we were had, had a little bit of trouble tracking down the plants. Um, Donica was able to send us some seeds for snap beans and potato, which um, turned out well. But I just wanted to show you a little bit about what we did. So um, we planted at two different times. We started with coneflower and milkweed. We had um, uh, uh, Rebecca lacinata um, and the common milkweed. Um, and those went in late May. And then we planted our snap bean and, um, uh, and potato uh, in mid-June. And so these are pictures of our high school interns. We have a, a eight week uh, high school intern program um, where they do a lot of horticultural work, um, learn about environmental careers, things like that. And so this was their mini research project was to collect data for the ozone biomonitoring garden. Um, and it was, it was, uh, interesting because it was it was I think it was kind of challenging for them um, I think they mostly liked it when it was really hot I think it was a little harder um, but we were able to sample weekly between June 26th and um, August 9th and then the internship ended then and then our staff we just weren't able to sample weekly uh, we sampled bi-weekly after after that um, so yeah if you want to go to the next slide so we had uh, four um, uh, plants in our garden. We had the coneflower, we had milkweed. These are hard to see. I'm showing pictures of the garden in August, um, on August 8th and then, then September 6th. Um, you can see some big differences, particularly with the snap bean. Um, so I'm just trying to show here that um, we really didn't see a lot of damage in our coneflower and our milkweed, at least um, due to ozone. Um, we had snap bean, we had a sensi the sensitive variety and the tolerant variety. And in August, everything looks great, but by September 6th, the sensitive snap beans were pretty much disintegrated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and even the tolerant uh, variety was um, really starting to show a lot of damage. Our coneflower persisted it did so well. Our milkweed also didn't show a lot of ozone damage, but it just got destroyed by aphids, I think. Um, and also they never flowered, which was unexpected. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think th those are really interesting observations. And I have found that the milkweed especially doesn't usually show damage until the second or third year that it's established. Uh -huh. And so it can take a little bit of time. And I imagine the coneflowers might be similar um, but I can also, I'm happy to send you seeds. Um, you know, I, the milkweed might eventually sh start showing damage, but I can mm -hmm. also send you seeds of coneflower that are collected from our garden that I know are genotypes that are actually, um, ozone bio indicators. And so that, yeah. Um, yeah, if that's what if that's what you'd prefer us to do, you want the same exact. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's necessarily preferable. It's just, okay. um, you might see differences and so it could be interesting I guess to yeah to see if you do see differences because there are um it does seem like there are potentially genotypes of coneflower that are more uh tolerant 
than mm-hmm. others, but, um, but it's hard to, it's hard to know. And we don't yeah. have a good sense for what causes that genotypic level variation at this point. So we got these cone flowers um, at a, as seedlings at a local nursery, um, a, a nursery that's focused on Pennsylvania native plants. They're very specific. Um, so they were really, I think they're really good quality plants. If you want the seeds or something like that, I could, I could, or a plant tissue or something, I could probably send you some. Um, yeah. But uh, it was interesting to see um, very little damage. Yeah, but you saw, it, it looks like you saw a lot of damage on the snap beans. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes um, and, it, and it looks to me like you see a similar result that I often see at the NCAR gardens which is you go from having very little damage to being totally decimated in a short period of time yes yes so um, the next slide um, this is just plots of the milkweed and the coneflower mm-hmm. um, and I also planted Donica's or I, I plotted um, Donica's uh, coneflower data from 2018, just as a comparison. Yeah. Um, and this is just time points between June 26th and September, um, did I say September 29th? Mm-hmm. Um, September 19th, I think. Um, and these aren't evenly spaced time points, I apologize. This was just a really quick plot. Um, <laughs> but you can see that we really, we saw a little bit of, um, of damage increasing, but I don't know, it's just, very little variation throughout the season. Um, we certainly do see uh, somewhat of an increase, but um, really not really not that much. Um, this is, so the snap bean, I don't, I have those data. Um, I didn't plot them for today just because the intervals were a little bit different. We started later. Um, but as you could see from that, uh, those pictures that I took, we definitely saw differences uh, in ozone damage on the snap, uh, snap bean. Cool. So, yeah, um, I think that that's all you have, correct? Yes, that's all I have. Yeah, well, thanks yeah. for sharing that. I think it's really interesting to see um, what you found. And the the high school, was it high school or college interns? High school interns. High school interns. Um, that seems to work out well in terms of getting yeah. some students involved. Yeah, I like doing that. I think... Um, one of the challenges uh, was really trying to get them to understand the differences in the in the injury scores, um, and um, also randomizing plant the, the the leaves of the plants and identifying. I'm just not I'm not a plant person by training, yeah. um, but figuring out a good protocol for randomly choosing leaves. If if there's a way we could do that consistently, um, yeah, a, I be you, really helpful. Yeah, you had emailed me that point, and I um, I don't have a good answer, but in thinking about it, I was trying to, because, so some gardens, they actually will follow the same leaves through time, but I find that that's pretty difficult to do with uh, citizen science data collection. Yeah. Um, and so one of the thoughts that I had is just trying to sample, like, a third of the leaves from the top, like, top part of the plant, a third of the leaves from the middle part of the plant, and a third of the leaves from the bottom part of the plant. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah, and so that was, that, you know, that's sort of the the way that after you had emailed me that, that's the way that I was trying to think about it when I continued my sampling throughout the, <laughs> the summer just to see how that worked. And I feel like that at least allows me to sort of think about sampling all parts of the plant canopy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, you, that's potentially one way, but I don't, if other people have ideas based on their experience collecting data, um, you know, I'm definitely open to suggestions because I don't have a good answer to that, to how to randomly sample. The yeah. Leaves. Well, we're, we're open to suggestions. So I look yeah. forward to hearing from other folks, but yeah, exactly. No, that's all I've got you. for now. Okay. Thanks, Does anybody Jennifer. else have questions for Sarah before we move on? Okay. We can come back to questions as well. Um, so Brianna, I'll, uh, I'll let you, um, talk next. So hello, I'm going to reintroduce myself. Um, I'm Brianna Finley. I'm a freshman at Spelman College and I'm involved in, um, health science and I will be representing the health science program and and environmental task force at Spelman College. Next slide, please. So the environmental task force is a student-ran organization on Spelman campus, and what we do is we give out education and we get 
the Hispanic community more aware on environmental issues inside and outside the campus. But doing so, we do lectures, we do workshops, and we do educational events throughout the span of the year. Next slide, please. Our relationship with the Ozone Garden and this research with Dr. Huang, we do maintenance, um, weekly weeding and daily just checking to see if the garden is up to par. We do data collection and where we do take pictures for Dr. Huang and you know, maybe in the future we may analyze the plants with him. For future reference, we would do um, analysis activities with this with Spelman's campus to get the community more involved, like the ozone and how it is on the ground level. And all of this is just an educational resource for the public that involves the ozone. Next slide. So the plants that are in the garden right now, we have tobacco, snap bean, a potato. And just back to what the previous um, lady was explaining, our snap beans were destroyed, I should say. This is my first time being involved in the ozone, with the ozone garden, but we did see that the, that the snap beans were, they, they did take an effect to the ozone so far. Next slide. So with the um, environmental task force, our main priority is to do sustainability education. And we do this through our events. We um, constantly promote pollution reduction and we constantly do alternatives and methods for healthy lifestyle practices. We always do promoting for the public awareness for the environmental issues inside and outside campus like recycling and our research with Dr. Huang. So that's it right now. And I do plan on being more involved with the Ozone Garden research and becoming more involved in like these chats with you guys as well. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, we're excited to have your involvement. I, so you guys, are you and is the environmental task force there throughout the summer? So I'm a freshman. I can't answer that, right. but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just started. Oh, we, we just started. Yeah, we just started. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I, I just was curious because um, that's typically when the gardens grow and that it's part of what makes them um, the gardens difficult at uh, in some schools it's part of the reason why we don't have a lot of high school involvement in particular is because it can be um, challenging to have these gardens at schools growing over the summer when people aren't there <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but there's a uh, there's a lot of exciting things that I think um, you can do and it's great that that you uh, have the garden already planted and it's in a public space. And you said you saw damage on the snap bean leaves? Yes. Okay. And another member was just cleaning up the area and we saw that the snap beans were mostly destroyed to a comparison to the tobacco and to the potato plant. They were basically fine, I should say. Great, okay. You So you have the three basically agricultural plants yes. there and, um, and the snap beans are what you saw the most damage on. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I'll be, did you, did you record data anywhere? Did you actually, do you know if there's data collected or recorded? We, we actually have some data from um, the EPA around here. This income, this past summer, uh, the ozone concentration in Atlanta was pretty high. We actually had several orange alerts on ozone concentration for the AQ in the, uh, uh, index. So yeah. um, I, I will go check that data again to see. Yeah, I'm just curious. Really uh, caused by those high ozone in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then did you record the severity of the ozone injury on any of those plants or did you just notice the damage? Well, I did take pictures. I didn't, I didn't upload it on the slide. Yeah, yeah no, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I did take pictures. Mostly just curious garden yeah great yeah well that's um it's exciting that you have is this the first year or the second year of the garden do you know actually the first quarter actually <laughs> it's the first year is that what you said yeah first year yeah that's um yeah that's great it's exciting to see uh both the phipps garden and this garden getting going for the first year mm -hmm. thanks um Okay, and I think, I think next we'll move on to Maria's garden in Sheffield. So, okay, so this is the, it's actually it's the first awesome garden in the UK. <clears throat> and in fact, we didn't call it awesome garden because the UK doesn't have an awesome surface awesome problem. We have actually a problem in nitrogen dioxide, but we established the awesome garden with the excuse of bringing the, with, to 
with the excuse of working with the local schools and talk about air pollution and what the children and parents can do to reduce air pollution. And so we have this, we established the Ozone Garden in 2016 and it has been run continuously since then. So we have wheat, clover and snap beans. We get sensitive and tolerant and we get the seeds from the Center of Ecology and Hydrology from Felicity Hayes and Katrina Sharp. But I think they also get the snap beans from the U, the snap bean seeds from the U.S. anyway. Yeah. Um, so we established this year, we established the garden in June, early June, and we work actually with a uh, non-decorat. Every year I apply for a grant within the University of Sheffield, <laughs> and I get a, an undergraduate working with us during the summer. So she actually helps maintaining the gardens and running the events that we have with the local schools. Um, next slide. Um, so I just want to show you that typical levels of ozone that we deal here in the UK. So this is ridiculous compared to what you have in the, U the US. So uh, we have an average of 30, 40 ppb across the summer. And there was only two times, I mean, a few days that we reached 50 and 60 ppbs. In the UK, we, in Europe, we measure ozone in micrograms cubic meters. So, so that's, uh, I just put the lines of the World Health Organization limit for to protect human health, not just not uh, plants uh, health, uh, and also the European standard, which is 120 micrograms per cubic meter, which is 60 ppb. So this year, actually, we didn't get any ozone damage on the plants. Previous last summer was unusually hot and warm, and we got uh, damage on the snap beans and the sensitive plants. This year, it was a complete disaster. We had a lot of rain and pretty much the awesome garden was eaten by slugs. <laughs> I was like, I mean, in May, it may, the month of June, the slugs ate the whole, it's <laughs> not been. So we only end up having clover and weeds. But anyway, we had the garden there and we had the excuse to bring the work with the local schools. So in a, we, we ranked three, events or through activities with the schools because sometimes some of those schools come with 15, 30 children and they take the bus. So we cannot just sow the garden. We run other activities really with air pollution. And this garden, actually, our awesome garden is at the Seafield Botanical Garden. So we have a space and we have the, we have also uh, uh, have trees around so we can run other other activities within the botanical garden. So if you pass the slide, next slide. No? Okay. So what we do with the awesome garden is we bring local schools and they help us plant the garden and we talk I mean, with that excuse, we talk about air pollution, what is surface ozone, what does to the plants and human health. And then we also run another activity. So you pass the next slide. And this is what we call the lichen survey of the lichen hand. We give the children magnifying lens and we have a problem with nitrogen dioxide and the Seville Botanical Garden is next to big main roads in the city. So we are the average nitrogen dioxide levels in the Botanical Garden is around 15, 20 ppb, which the uh, human health uh, air quality standard is 20 ppb. So some in some days and some weeks, actually, we are above what is considered health. I mean, we are above, we are in breach of this air quality garden, um, this air quality standard. So what we do is that we give the children uh, ID identification chart, and we let them go around the garden uh, looking for trees with lichens, and we ask them to identify the type of lichens. Of course, there are. I mean, I have the identification chart here. There are nitrogen sensitive lichens where they don't grow when nitrogen dioxide or nitrogen levels are high. And then we have nitrogen loving, which is the, the orange one. And of course, pretty much all the lichens that we find at the botanical gardens are nitrogen like uh, nitrogen loving. So for the children that are infant and junior, we just ask them to identify the lichens. But then, and these are actually a, uh, 
survey that is uh, available online and it's a poor citizen science project that is run here in the UK. But there is a, if you pass the slide, please, uh, Danica. There is a survey that when we work with high school and also with college students, we ask the students to fill up the survey. So they have to identify the tree, what type of tree, and they do a survey. They count the number of lichens, the type of lichens, and then we can submit that survey and actually you can map the nitrogen dioxide levels across the UK depending on the type of lichens that you find. And the third activity that we run, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, is we asked the infant and the junior just when we work with the local schools to make seed bombs, and so every children brings a a, a bomb with a wildflower seeds at home, and we talk about the need of uh, having flowers uh, in our gardens for bees and pollinators, and I don't have that many pictures of that because it's a messy activity and the person that runs the activity that's a Sara, the undergrad student couldn't take any picture and I was busy with the lichen survey and so anyway so there are no pictures but actually this activity the children really like it and everybody's able to bring a, a ball a bomb with uh, seeds at home so don't ask me about awesome gar awesome damage <laughs> because we didn't get any. But with the skews, actually, we, we work with the children with other activities, really, with air pollution. Mm -hmm. Sheffield. Okay. Yeah, and you, you said that the problem in Sheffield is with nitrogen dioxide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we which, have. Yeah. It's a precursor to ozone formation as well, right, if you have enough light? Yes, so last summer, actually, we, we had damage in the snap yeah. bee. So we had yeah. a, a couple of weeks where levels of ozone reached 60 ppb, but are not the levels that you are seeing in Colorado <laughs> or, in the, or in across the U.S. Some other parts of the U.S. And yeah. sometimes, but sometimes the levels of nitrogen dioxide are so high that they titrate ozone. Mm -hmm. So we have ozone titration close yeah. to the road sometimes. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, I, I guess the reason that I, um, I bring that up is because these activities, I feel like, are also potentially useful at other gardens, other ozone mm -hmm. gardens, because it's, I mean, not only is it related to ozone, but it's also related to air quality. At least mm -hmm. nitrogen dioxide is another one of EPA's criteria, air pollutants that is regulated. Um, and it's, you know, it doesn't, always cause quite as much damage as ozone, but it is still mm -hmm. an important air pollutant, so. And I, I think there's value, and a lot of our, you know, our gardens are at museums or places where children are regularly, um, and so having other activities aside from identifying ozone injury is really important. So seeing some of the things that you're doing in the gardens and how they can engage them, I think is really valuable. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's really cool to see um, and to, you know, go look for lichens on the trees, I think, is a, a in doing the surveys is a, a fun activity as well. Um, so I, I have put actually the link so where you can get the yeah. surveys and everything. So everything is on the slide. So if anybody's interested in downloading the survey or the lichen identification chart, it's, it's all available online. And yeah. for anybody with, you know, a tempo connection to the gardens, uh, nitrogen dioxide is one of the things that Temple will be me measuring too. So. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. so someone's hearing nitrogen dioxide. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Maria. Um, so anybody, I want to, I guess, before we move on to thinking about overwintering the gardens, does anybody have questions for any of our garden presenters, how they did anything? Or um, This is Gabrielle. I have a question for Brianna. Is she, you're still here? Um, since I'm at a university and I would like to get undergraduates involved in this, I just wondered if you have some thoughts on the best way to get students involved and what kind of works for you and what are challenges? So for me, as a freshman, I got into the environmental task force because also because of my major, but through the students. So basically, Spelman itself is like a community where everybody tries to get you involved in certain things. So one thing I would say is to have students represent represent the actual club or like the service that you're doing because to have an instructor or a professor represent it, it could just be their job, you know? As a person, 
as students, you want to be more involved in like our passion. So maybe just having actual representation for the students, like maybe one or two people that will go out and reach out to people. That's what I feel. Yeah, and Gabby, it might be, um, you know, you, you were in Denver and so is the Denver University um, group that is also working on planting an ozone garden. So it might also be nice to, you know, it, just connect and talk across that as well. I think that they're, um, they're pretty excited and open to talking. Um, and of course, you know, you're also always welcome to come and check out our ozone gardens at NCAR. And uh, Guan Yu, I know you're still in the room. How did you find the task force group at, at Spelman? Like how did you engage the students? I think that might be also helpful. Oh yeah, I actually uh, talked to several clubs that are related to environment and sustainability to see if they are, uh, you know, interested in helping us on this go to Ozone Garden and uh, some related projects. Some, so actually, I gave this assignment to the students in the club to let us help us to, you know, hiring some new students um, on this project. On this project, so basically. Uh, I rely on student, your higher student. Great, but you went out to a bunch of clubs till you found the right fit, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Um, any other questions for any of our garden? Um, okay, well, if questions do come up, feel free to just jump in and ask, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll just talk a little bit about um, our overwintering the gardens, I guess. Um, and so I split this up into the types of plants that I have here at NCOP, what we do, um, but I think that these can translate um, generally if you think about the types of plants that you have. So for example, I lumped the milkweed and the coneflower here because these are both some of our more um, natural species, not the agricultural species, but we treat them similarly in the garden. Um, and so if you have other plants, you know, perhaps they're lumped in with the milkweed and coneflower. Um, I separated out the potato and the snap bean because those are a little bit different in terms of how you overwinter them. Um, but just to start here, the milkweed and the coneflower, um, the seeds can be collected and stored. But they do, for both of these plant species, they do require a cold treatment or vernalization to germinate. And so I have um, just examples of what these look like. I don't know if anybody's interested, but the milkweed, the milkweed pods look like this. Um, they, I mean, this is already split open now, but they grow on the side of the plant. And then these um, seeds are actually, they'll get blown around in the wind. And I, <laughs> I would say that if you don't want these um, species of milkweed growing everywhere, you might want to consider cutting the pods anyway <laughs> before they split and open. Um, I know that a couple of places that I've helped establish gardens at um, were really, really didn't want to plant milkweed because they do start to, it doesn't seem like it at first, but they do start to take over after a little while. And so cutting the pods um, is something that I do regularly, especially here in Colorado, because the two species that are bioindicators are not native to Colorado. And so I just always try and clip the pods and then I'll keep some of them um, for seeds. But I also have been collecting our coneflower seeds. And so this is basically, you just collect the heads of the coneflowers after the um, petals fall off. So this is what it looks like. And then the these are all just like little seeds in here that you can pull, pull out these tiny little things. Um, and so you can harvest those and keep them. Um, so you can cut the seed pods and store. Um, I usually recommend paper bags just because you don't want things to be damp. If they're, if they're really dry, then you can store them in plastic bags too. But if they're not dry, you don't want to store them in plastic bags. Um, the seeds can be directly sowed into the ground in the fall as well. So you can collect the seeds if you want and just plant them in the ground directly or you can store them. And if you're going to plant them in the spring, you may need to refrigerate or freeze the seeds for a successful germin germin uh, germination. And I can, um, I have links on another slide that uh, that 
sort of go through the process for how to do that for the uh, coneflower and for the milkweed. Um, you can also just plant this, if you're not ready to plant in the fall, you can plant sort of in the um, springtime as, as well, but you might want to, if you're gonna plant doors, you might wanna plant before the end of the last frost, um, you know, so that they do get those cycles, they'll just be much more successful at germination with that. Um, and then just as far as the plants themselves, you cut the stems back to the ground with pruners and you can do this in the fall or in the spring, depending on um, what you wanna do. And so just cutting those, the, the plant material after it's died back to the ground, and then you can compost the um, above ground biomass if you want. And then, you know, next year, both of these plants will regrow because they're perennials. And so that's a nice thing about these gardens is that these plants will grow every year. You don't have to worry so much about planting them. Um, and so they're, they're, you know, once you get them established, they will continue to grow. Um, as for the snap beans, uh, what you want to do with these is when the plants have died, so the leaves turn brown and shriveled, you saw some, um, some photos of what they looked like in Sarah States' presentation. Um, but you can pull up the plant by the roots or you can just cut the stem to the ground. Um, you can harvest the seed pods on this, but we don't necessarily recommend planting those harvested pods unless you've only planted one type of the plant, sensitive or tolerant, because the, um, these two cultivars will interbreed and so the seeds will have unknown sensitivity. And so, um, you know, the USDA who provides us with this, they have said, you know, just get in touch with us for more seeds because they go through and they make sure that they're germinated and that the, the cultivar lines are, are continually propagated with only those. Here um, at NCAR, we're very space limited, so I actually have only planted the sensitive seeds, and so I'm gonna experiment this year with, I collected the seed pods for just the sensitive plants, um, and so hopefully those seed pods will have just the sensitive. Um, They'll, at least all of the plants I think will be sensitive. So I'm gonna plant those this next year and, and see how that turns out. Um, but one thing to note is that harvesting and weighing the pods is um, for the snap bean can be a fun end of season activity. And so you can track year to year variation and connect that with the severity of ozone damage. And you know, if some years you have more ozone damage than other years, maybe you'll have different weights of seed pods. But you can also compare the sensitive and tolerant cultivars if you have both of those and weigh the seed pods for each of those. And so that's kind of a fun end of season activity. It's, it's more or less a one-time thing for each um, season, but it is a, a nice activity to sort of show that ozone damage really can impact the weight of the seed pods. Um, and this is something that I know that Jack Fishman has done with his gardens in St. Louis and he published a paper in BAMS about ozone gardens and this is one of the activities that he highlights in that. So um, if you want more information, just let me know and I'm happy to share that with you. As far as the potatoes go, um, you want to make sure that you let the plants die. They'll, the leaves will turn yellow and then they'll dry up and turn brown. Um, if you live in a wet place or a place with long seasons, you might need to or want to reduce the watering for a few weeks for this to happen. If you're ready to harvest, just stop, <laughs> stop watering the potatoes and they will sort of dry up and turn brown. And then once the plants have died, you can dig up the tubers and you wanna sort of dig around, in the ground around the outside edges of the plants. And you can do this with just a a spade often will use like a pitchfork looking thing to dig them up. And then I'd say just, you can brush off some of the dirt. You don't want to scrub it at this point. Um, and you can cut off any above ground vegetation that's still stuck. And so I like to leave the plants in place so that I know where to dig up the potatoes until they're brown. And then I dig up the potatoes and then you can cut the top parts of the plant off. Um, and then you want to store the potatoes in paper bags or a cardboard box. Um, initially you want to store them inside at like more cool room temperatures. So they uh, recommend between 45 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit for about two weeks to cure. And then after curing, you wanna store in a cool dry place um, that's even cooler until they're ready for spring planting. So just keep in mind a fridge is ideal for winter storage, but a cool basement or garage are also good options if you don't have fridge space. I know that I don't always have fridge space. You do want to avoid freezing temperatures though, so I would suggest not leaving them outside, especially if it's supposed to freeze. 
Um, you, you know, they don't have to be below 40 degrees, but they're stored best at 40 degrees. Um, the last a few months, even at slightly warmer temperatures as well. Um, I, one thing that I, I included a note here is that harvesting can be difficult if they're planted near other garden plants. And so in our garden in the front at NCAR, um, we can't always dig up the potatoes without damaging the coneflower and the milkweed roots. And so what we found is that they typically survive the winter with a thick layer of mulch and they'll regrow the next year. So if that's also what you want to try, um, you can try that. But for like known storage to, to not sort of risk <laughs> knowing whether or not you can um, have the potatoes grow again next year, you might want to harvest them and then store them. Um, so those are, like I said, those are the four plants that we have in these gardens. So that's what I focused on. I imagine that <clears throat> the um, tobacco, I think, is you probably want to treat similarly to the snap bean where you just, you can pull the whole root system or not um, similar with probably wheat and clover. Um, you can just cut the tops or you can um, pull the root system. Some of those might actually regrow the next year. Um, if you don't pull the roots, but the snap beans won't regrow uh, the next year. So just things to keep in mind, and, and these are sort of general guidelines for different types of plants. Um, the last thing that I'll say is that after the gardens are harvested, I recommend that you apply a layer of mulch. Um, this will keep the soil a little more insulated from severe winter weather, and so this is a picture of one of our um, box gardens where we put down a layer of mulch, and this was of course taken in the spring, but um, you can see <laughs> the mulch in there. Um, it's also going to help keep the weeds out so you don't have to weed as much the next year, and it, it'll help maintain the soil moisture in the spring. And so in the spring, the perennials will sprout through the mulch, um, and then you can plant the beans and the potatoes in the soil under the mulch. I usually um, we'll sort of push the mulch aside and then plant the, um, the seeds of the potatoes and the beans underneath the mulch and then I just put the mulch back on top um, and they will sprout through. As you can see in this picture, these are the snap beans spreading through the mulch. Um, and then I just have a, a little bit of information on growing gardens next spring, just things to keep in mind, I guess, throughout the winter. Um, coneflower and milkweed are perennials and so they should regrow each year. For new gardens, I would recommend planting the seeds outdoors this fall if you can. Um, and if you can't, then you can also plant the seeds early spring next year um, outside before the last frost. Or if you want to start them indoors, then you can follow the processes for fertilization that are outlined on the um, websites below. Here's one for the coneflower and here's one for the milkweed. And it just sort of gives you some information on how to, you know, some you want to put them in the refrigerator and or the freezer. You don't have to follow these guidelines exactly, but um, but it probably will help with your germination success. Um, and Donica, just as another point, if folks are interested in coneflower and milkweed, um, we also have some gardens that are willing to send out uh, plants right. in the spring, but you need to know that kind of now so those gardens can plan for separating and digging up parts of their um, their existing. Plant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that um, that is also helpful information. And it sounds like potentially Ginger Butcher has some plants at the um, NASA Goddard Garden that she can provide. Yeah, we have a lot of um, coneflower um, and milkweed that I think we can we can divide up and everything else we've done is like tobacco and potato well we had we didn't do potatoes again so okay those are pretty much what we have and um, I know there was somebody said they're starting a garden over in Virginia yep Jane Metcalf um, so, would yes. love some seeds yeah. or some plants so we're that in Greenbelt so we're oh. pretty close uh, in Maryland so perhaps um, what we could do is just winter over our garden and then in the spring uh, you can come out and harvest the plants oh that would be great that would be great yeah, yeah. let's 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 um let's stay in touch about that and i i do have a question um do you have a preference with starting seeds in the of the coneflower and milkweed in the fall or the plants in the spring does it is there does it matter i don't know i don't know how much it matters um 
as we sort of, as I sort of was asking Sarah about her garden at the Phipps um, Conservancy, I think the first year that the plants are planted, they don't um, they don't always show as much ozone damage in the first year. If you get the if you get the plants and are transplanting the plants, it might expedite that process. Um, and I think you know transplanting. So both the coneflower and the milkweed grow through rhizomes, which are underground stems. And so if you get those root sections, they'll usually um, they usually will take and uh, grow pretty well. Okay. The milkweed. Um, the germination success for milkweed is actually pretty low um, in talking to some milkweed planting experts. Yeah. They'll say that, you know, it's like a 25% success rate for germination. Um, and so that's, you know, that's just another thing to keep in mind, but you can, I, you can try both if you, if you want and see um, what takes. Um, the, the websites that I list on the slides, um, they uh, they give some information about planting densities and things like that, and I can try and compile some of that information. And um, some of that's our planting densities in, is in the uh, garden. Okay, booklet that's on. Yeah, there. there you go. So it's already we already have some of that information compiled, and uh, we can send out if anybody wants it this spring. We can resend. Um, but yeah, so I guess that I, the reason that I sort of include this information. The coneflowers and the milkweed is because you know planting them this fall it, as far as the seeds um you know that's that's a good thing and then i think um if you if you can and if you're planting from seed and then in the um spring you know if you have plants or if you're putting in seeds put them in pretty early before the freeze thaw cycle ends um but the plants if you have root sections to transplant that that's also useful and helpful and you know, the, the first year or two years, the gardens might look a little thin, but then they um, they really start to grow in and uh, look really full <laughs> after probably about two years. Um, and, I, you know, at this point, I'm cutting back milkweed in our and car garden quite a bit every year, even though the first probably two to three years that I was growing the milkweed, it didn't, it didn't look like it was going to survive very well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and then potatoes should also be planted within about two to three weeks before the last frost, so sometime in the early spring. Um, but the snap beans usually get planted a little bit later. They, sh they should be after the last frost in the spring, so that's probably going to be the last thing that you plant in your gardens. As far as emergence of plants, I usually see the coneflowers are out first, the milkweeds come out next, the potatoes come out after that, and then the snap beans, because they're usually planted later, are the, the last to emerge. Um, I always see damage, at least in, in, at NCAR, I always see damage on the coneflowers first. The potatoes and the snap beans usually start showing damage around the same time, and both of those sort of go from not have not showing much damage to showing a lot of damage um, in a short period of time. So that's usually how it progresses. Um, yeah, so that's just, I guess, a little bit of information on overwintering your gardens, thinking about what to do to get started for next spring as well. Um, I just wanted to, we can go back and ask questions, but I just wanted to also highlight that we're, uh, we're in, we're just starting this process of making a new website. And this is, um, I'm excited about this because this is uh, work that we'll get to do with the CU Boulder Computer Science Senior Capstone class. So they're senior computer science majors and they're basically treating this as a project. They actually have a bunch of different um, projects that they can choose from and then the students get sort of assigned or they sort of get to select what they're interested in and then get assigned to a group. And so we have a group of, I think, six or so um, computer science students that are putting together um, They'll, they'll help us develop this new website for the gardens. And so um, I pulled the four objectives that we had written up in our application for this. And so um, basically the website will provide some basic information about the Ozone Garden project, including the objectives of the Ozone Garden, like why it's important. Um, and it'll have garden locations. I'm hoping that we have a map of all of our different garden locations. 
Um, it should include some training on how to identify ozone damage and distinguish ozone damage from insect damage and other types of leaf damage. And I'm hoping that we have um, a photo repository so that people can actually look at photos. Um, and then it will also allow us to collect data on various types of plants at the gardens. And so our data collection will not be the data collection worksheets anymore. You can still use those if you want to enter the, and then enter the data online. Um, but this will allow anybody with a smartphone to come up to the gardens and say like, oh, I'm interested in this. I should look at how to go, how to identify ozone damage and go through a short training or potentially skip that and then actually look at the ozone or look at the leaves and enter the data just right on their phone. And I was prototyping um, an early version of this website this year. And I have to say that being able to do it on my phone and just have it already entered rather than writing it on the data collection worksheet and then going back and entering it was so much easier. <laughs> and so I'm really excited about this new capability and I think it will allow a lot more people to participate in data collection. Um, and then uh, based, on, based on work that um, one of Erica's interns did that we saw at the last meeting and also um, what Sarah States had recommended to me was that uh, it would be helpful to include some sort of visualization of the data. And so I'm hoping that each of the gardens, you know, wherever the garden location is, you know, somebody can come and click on that garden location and they can choose to enter data. They can also look at how the ozone damage has changed through time based on the data that's collected at that garden. And I'm hoping that we can also connect that to the other gardens seeing like where are, you know, what is, you know, so if we have data from Spelman College, how does that compare to the gardens in Pittsburgh and Sheffield and Colorado and Virginia and elsewhere? And, you know, you can sort of compare different plants. And so um, this is very much a work in progress. I think it's an ambitious project. I'm hoping that these, um, these computer science students are going to be excited about this and, and help us get this done. It might not all get done this year. <laughs> Um, but it, I think it'll be exciting and we might reach out to the gardens um, throughout the winter from time to time just to get sort of feedback and or information um, for the website. So, yeah, that's, that's all I have. We have about five minutes left if anybody has questions or thoughts or anything on you know, the new website or on the, um, you know, how to overwinter the gardens or activities from the other gardens. I have a, this is Emmy. Uh, I have a comment. If you're harvesting your garden, if you're collecting seeds, another way to collect data about ozone damage is to weigh the seeds from the ozone sensitive plants and from the ozone tolerant plants or weigh the potatoes from the sensitive and tolerant plants mm -hmm. because um, ozone can affect the, the reproductive um, biomass or the potato mass mm -hmm. and so that's just another way to kind of make this into a make this um, harvesting activity into a, a data collection and a learning experience. Yeah exactly and so similar to what we highlighted for the beans the snap beans a little bit earlier yeah I agree you could do the same for potatoes if you have um, sensitive and tolerant varieties of potatoes in your garden. Um, I I mean, maybe you can comment on this, but I would think that it would be a little more challenging to, to do that for the milkweed and the cone flower. Yeah, there's, um, there's a paper out recently that um, compares sort of seed production or, or seeds per flower um, and even flower biomass and finds a difference between ozone uh, damaged and, and um, ozone tolerant um, and so it's you know you may not see anything but it's sort of it's worth a look if you if you're interested I would say yeah yeah definitely yeah it would be interesting you know if there are gardens that are interested in doing that um, yeah it would be interesting in developing some some protocols so that other gardens could more similarly do the same things yeah I think I think it exists for the the beans because I think that that's a really easy one to <laughs> collect the seed pods on. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the potatoes and, it, you know, I think it would be harder to do for the milkweed and for the coneflower, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. 
So. Um, this is Jane Metcalf. I have a just a question for the other people who have put up gardens as we're just getting started. Um, and we're trying, we're thinking about signage and how we, you know, educate people about this. And I, I wondered if there was an opportunity to share some of that across the gardens, the maybe the different um, educational materials as well as the signs. And I know there's some on the website, um, but I would love to see some examples of other others because we want to personalize it a bit to our area, of course. Yeah. So just thoughts about that. Yeah, I think that we have um, a couple different examples of signs and files for signs. Um, I know that we have the ones that we use at NCAR that are editable, and I know that Erica has some for the Tempo Gardens that are also editable. Okay. Um, and so I, I do think that some of those are available and perhaps others would also be um, interested in sharing their signs if they've designed something that's even more different. Yeah. So um, you say that the what's on the website is editable, so we could download it and, and make changes to it? I, Erica, is that true? I mean, yes. I know that we have files for them. I don't know if those are on the website. The tempo, okay. the tempo ones that are on the website are editable. I think yours are not. Um, but we do have those files and yeah. we're happy to and share. I can, we can yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um. We. Yeah. That's one of the things we're going to work on over the winter is getting the signs up. And yeah. Exactly. And I think. I mean, the tempo um, signs are are nice, and I think that they work across a lot of gardens. The ones that we have for NCAR, I know that we um, put up the sources. You know, like what contributes to ozone mm -hmm. in Colorado's front range, and so we have graphs on there that might not be quite as useful, but you could look at those and potentially you know, think about if you wanted to make something similar for your region or you know, whatever. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So those are, those are available. And yeah, I would say that if anybody is, is doing um, any projects with the ozone gardens, you know, similar to what Emmy was just talking about papers published with, you know, these things, you know, it doesn't have to be publication, but if anybody has activities that they want to Right up or willing to share. I know Maria also provided um, links to some of the activities that she was doing. Um, we are more than happy to sort of collate those and share those. And I think Erica already has a um, part of that started. Mm -hmm. So we can just continue to add more. And I, I would definitely encourage folks to, to do that and to share things that are working in their gardens because it gives other gardens um, opportunities to, to use those. And I think that that's a powerful part of this network. Mm -hmm sharing those activities. Um, okay, well, it's about 1030. So I will let everyone go at this point. But uh, if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact Erica or myself or any, um, any of the folks that you saw presenting here. Thank you to all of the gardens who did present and talked a little bit about their gardens. Um, and we're always excited to hear more about anybody else's garden if you ever want to share. Um, I, I guess the one last thing that before everybody signs off is uh, I'm not sure how much we need to meet over the winter, but maybe sometime in the early spring we can meet again to talk about getting gardens going for the spring, if that sounds like a good plan. I think that's a great plan. And if um, folks have questions, you know, in the off season, reach out to us. Uh, or if you're planning and you kind of want some more personalized advice on how to get your garden going or you're looking for plants, let us know. Reach out before then. But I think, yeah. Well, fantastic. Thanks for joining okay. us today. Thank you for organizing. Yep. Thank you, Donica. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right.